My favorite de Kooning story is when he first arrived in America, he was at a diner in Hoboken and he was watching the waiter behind the counter pour cups of coffee. And the waiter had all the cups lined up and he poured one continuous stream of coffee down one side and right back the other. And it was spilling and splashing everywhere and filling every cup. And de Kooning remarked, what a great country this is. It's an interesting statement coming from de Kooning in that his one-size-fits-all, mass-produced sensibility was a precursor to pop art. And it's also an apt metaphor for painting itself. I love the industry of painting. I love the manipulation of sticky, obdurate oil paint. And through the modulation of color and the distribution of marks, creating a world that didn't exist before. It's also an apt metaphor for painting in that, as painters, we start in general terms, in broad strokes, and then we work our way down into detail. A teacher once told me to start like a bricklayer and end like a jeweler. So no matter how elegant the final product is, there's still a certain primal sloppiness to painting, which I am obsessed with. It was Picasso that said that a painting is a lie that tells the truth. So that makes me a 6'3", 230-pound liar. We were just back down in South Carolina visiting family, and I got to go to one of my favorite places called Brook Green Gardens in Merle's Inlet. It's a beautiful natural setting, redolent of the kind of environment in which I grew up, with Spanish moss and live oak trees and rivers. It also has a formal sculpture garden in which I've spent many hours drawing as a child and also as an adult. It's important to me from time to time to reconnect with place. And I've always felt that I don't need a position because I have a place, I have that core. I also feel that the world around me is unknowable and through repeated encounters with brush on canvas, I long to distill something concrete from something transient. I have no interest in depicting the appearance of landscape in oil paint. Everything I need from the coast of South Carolina, where I come from, I've already taken. It's already deeply ingrained inside of me. It's a well which I can continually dip down into and access to generate content. Mine is much more of a personal and internalized approach, which is certainly nothing new. And it doesn't have to be new, it just has to be good. I'm using nature as personal artifice. So for me, landscape is more of an idea or a canopy under which I can explore greater themes of emotion and obsession and longing with a fuller resonance than if I were just depicting appearance. So I think that's the Southern in me, that embracing of the emotive aspects of painting with excess and eccentricity. I moved to New York from South Carolina in, right out of college in 1987. And one of the first jobs I had was in a gallery called Kevin Morris, who specializes in the work of self-taught artists. One of the discoveries I made was Minnie Evans, who was born in 1892, died in 1987, which is the year I moved here. And hers is nature seen from the inside out. Right away, one can sense her burning need to possess the world around her, the world she knew best, and then reorder it in such a way that it suggests a world within the world. Or as a friend of mine likes to say, a world better than the outside world. Or as Leo Steinberg, who passed away this week, said, anything anybody can do, painting can do better. So with her innate sense of design, and I mean that in the best possible sense, 
the importance of design, of visual acumen, and of putting materials together in such a way that it expresses vigor and clarity and truth. She would take nature around her and create more or less symmetrical, circular compositions, which refer to Persian art and to Chinese and Tibetan, but also to Yoruban divination trays with their circular elements, suggesting a celestial order or some sort of hidden structure. That symmetrical design was one of the things I dug about Celtic art, which is why I went to live in Ireland for a year in 1997. And again, the notion of suggesting a world within a world was important to me then, and it's still important in my work now. Design is a critical element in a painting. The arrangement of visual material to suggest strength and clarity and one can find it everywhere. I look for design in automobiles, in architecture, in advertising, in fashion, and of course in painting. And many names come to mind. Uh, ben Shan, for instance, Bronzino, De Chirico, all had fabulous senses of design. Another self-taught artist who I discovered then who is important to me is John Searle who lived from 1894 to 1993. And here's a picture of John and I in his home in Lake Elsinore, California, about a year before he died. And uh, he, he's so cool, and I'm such a dork. <laughs> he had a career as a vaudeville, vaudeville performer, as a actor, and even as a farmhand. And he creates worlds inhabited by casts of sideshow performers and freaks and contortionists and half animal, half humans, all painted in, a, in a bruised colors with an expressionistic fervor akin to Nolde. I have nine or ten Searles, which I, I love. And one of the things that struck me and still does in his work is, is there's a murmur of loneliness and longing. And I mean that, I mean loneliness in a good sense, in, in a, in a, a in solitude and in, in the, a, a need to transform oneself. And one of the things that threads together Searle with Minnie Evans and with many of the other self-taught artists whom I admire is that, that unconditional burning need to, to make things and to dream and then muscle that into physical form with an urgency and, and, a, and a, a crackling vitality to seek truth. It brings me to the notion of ecstasy, which is a keystone in my work. And I use the word ecstasy as defined by the late Canadian pianist Glenn Gould, who is my hero, who lived from 1932 to 1982. It was Gould who said that the purpose of art is the gradual, lifelong construction of a state of wonder and serenity. And he defines ecstasy not as some euphoric emotion coming from looking at a painting or listening to a piece of music, but is that moment of heightened awareness where two identities are joined together through the terms of the work, the viewer and the, art and, and the artist two consciousness grafted together, true tender human communication one-to-one -one, through the work of art, through the form. And it brings us back to the tikkuning metaphor of the coffee cups, spilling and splashing and brimming with generosity and content. Tikkuning was right. <laughs> 